Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is truly an honor and a privilege to be here in the house of the Lord one more time with each and every one of your smiling faces. Uh, we've got a couple of quick announcements for you this morning, so please bear with us. Uh, we are continuing our efforts to collect uh, backpacks for SBCV's uh, Christmas backpack program. If there are any questions, there are flyers in the foyer uh, that describe the items, describe when and where you need to have those backpacks to us, uh, but think of this as a missionary opportunity for each and every one of us to get involved in. This is helping those who are underprivileged have something at Christmas time that they can really truly be thankful for. So if you're inclined to do so, uh, pick up one of those flyers, fill it with, uh, uh, get a backpack, fill it with the items that are on the list and bring that back so that someone's Christmas can be changed. Trunk or treat, it is right around the corner. Uh, and I hate to say that they still got candy corn uh, on the slide. Uh, Y'all know how I feel about that. But if you are inclined to be a part of the trunk or treat, uh, make sure that you have registered your vehicle. Make sure that you have picked up lots of candy and make sure that you're actually here on the 30th to take part. On that same day, we're going to have our car show. Um, both events start at 1 o'clock and go until 4 p.m. But if you have a, a car enthusiast that you know that would be interested in showcasing their vehicle, by all means, get them registered. Um, as the slide says, we need help getting candy. Um, I can't say that I've got a couple bags in my office, but uh, I'm not sharing. If you got the urge to help out with a uh, truck, uh, the, shh, uh, if you're inclined to help with that, uh, please, uh, there are a couple uh, containers out in the, the foyer that you can drop your bags of candy off. Uh, again, we'll be collecting those all the way up into the event. So please, if you're inclined to do so, help us out in that regard so that we can have a great time on the 30th. This coming Wednesday's uh, acti schedule activities are postponed uh, so that we can have our normal quarterly business meeting. That business meeting starts at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. If there are any questions about what is going on, by all means, reach out to your church staff during the course of the week so that you can be prepared to be a part of the business of Raymond's Baptist Church. As always, we'd like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your faithfulness and your giving, your generosity and your giving, your commitment to giving. We know that each and every one of us has a uh, part in God's kingdom, and this is where our tithes and offerings come into play. Our tithes and offerings are collected there in the foyer at the two desks and the two containers that are provided. Know that you can give your offering there. If not there, know that you can give it online. If not online, know that you can drop it in the mail. And if not in the mail, you can drop it by the church office during our normal business hours and see our smiling faces. Uh, however you give, give with a cheerful heart, knowing that what you have done is going to impact the work of God's kingdom. Amen? Our deacons of the week are Tim Eicher and Carol Blake. Their contact information is there on the screen. If you have a prayer request, an emergent need, or just need someone to speak to during the course of the week, these are the two gentlemen this week who should be available for you. And if for whatever reason you can't contact them, know that your church staff is also available to you. Those have been our morning announcements. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly gracious Father, we once again come before your throne, hearts filled with thanks and appreciation for who you are, what you've done, and what you're going to do in and through our lives. Lord, we are ever so grateful that you have allowed us to be wakened this morning, clothed in our right mind, purposed our day to come and be in your house of worship, to hear your word, to sing songs of praises to you, and to fellowship with one another under your banner of love, truth, and grace. Lord, we thank you for the man of God that you've sent us in, Dr. Richard, who comes and brings your word week in and week out, challenging us and, and convicting us where your Holy Spirit is led to teach us and to show us what ways that we can be more engaged in your kingdom's work. We're ever mindful and ever appreciative of uh, the man that you sent us in, Pastor Chuck, who leads us in 
thoughtful songs of worship and praise that whatever offering we give to you is a truly a blessing unto your ears. And Lord, we're ever grateful for each and every brother and sister who we encounter here each week that shows a smile and greets us with a handshake or a hug and just celebrates around your word with us. We know that these are not things that everyone is blessed with and we are thankful for the blessing of. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in this day and we're thankful for all that we will be a part of as we listen, as we sing, as we teach and as we hear. May everything that we do ultimately bring honor and glory to your name. And we pray all these things in the matchless name of your son, Jesus the Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Woody. Good morning, church. Good morning. Awesome. Anybody had a rough week? Anybody have a rough day this week? Yeah, well, I got good news for you. Our Lord says that we're going to see a victory. We're going to open by singing a wonderful praise tune. I'm going to see a victory. Would you stand with me, please? A weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord.
You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, we read these words. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I can remember as a little boy sitting in church and singing the hymn that we're getting ready to sing and thinking, aren't I lucky that someone shared Jesus with me and I have this victory that we're singing about. We're going to sing victory in Jesus. verse for a minute. Do you realize what you were singing? Oh my goodness. Oh, victory in Jesus. You are victorious because you have Jesus in your life. My Savior forever. He's never going to leave you. You don't lose him. You've accepted him as Lord and Savior. He is yours forever throughout eternity. He sought me and bought me. He came for you. He ran to you and he bought you with his blood. He loved me before I ever knew him. He loved us first. I don't know why, but he did. And he does. And he loves us. And all my love is due him. Not hanging on to any bit, not any pieces. I'm giving it all. As Dr. Richard says, a sacrificial living, a sacrificial love. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Oh, my goodness. I hope as you were singing that you were realizing what you were singing, a testimony to the victory of Jesus. You know, my mom doesn't like modern songs very much. I get it. She's uh, a little bit older than I am. 
few years. But there is one song that she really likes. So I want to tell you that the song that we're getting ready to sing is not a modern worship song. I guess it could be classified as that. But really it's a modern hymn. And we've sung a few modern hymns recently. This song she loves. And she goes, I don't know why I love this song so much. But it's modern and I love it. Here's why you love it, Mom. How great the chasm that lay between us. There's nothing we can do to fix it. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. We can't fix the lostness of our souls. But I just said, he runs to us. And he loves us. And he wants us to belong to him. As we sing living hope, concentrate on the fact that he loves you. And that you have the most greatest, most wonderful gift you could ever have in Jesus Christ. Let's sing living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Sing about resurrection morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim. That's worth singing again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on.
praise this morning. Amen. You may sit. You may be seated. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Psalms 23. I'll be reading from the Old Testament uh, this morning. I like that psalm from the, the Old Testament. Stand with me, if you would, as we share together God's Word. Psalmist says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, thank you for these words of encouragement, uh, words that speak to us in many different ways and many different situations. And Father, sometimes we uh, just read certain passages of Scripture uh, over and over, and they, they are very powerful to us, but sometimes in the repetition we really forget the true meaning of what you're trying to get across to us. And so, Father, we want to look at this psalm today in the context of not only uh, in passing, but in living. So open our hearts that we might receive the message you have for us today, and we give you the praise and the glory for it all. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this has turned out to be uh, the third message of a series. I didn't realize I was preaching until this week as I prepared uh, this message. And this series is definitely going to be a work in progress. I've entitled it now, uh, like the last uh, two messages, uh, For All to Hear, God Is. And I'm going to share with you some of the characteristics of who God really is. And three weeks ago, I shared that uh, God is still God. If you were here, you may remember that. Then two weeks ago, uh, God is love. Now, this week, uh, I want to share with you that uh, God is our, our shepherd. And this is a message for all of us to hear. And it never gets old it's still as alive and real and relevant as the day it was written. And I don't know how long this series is going to last. I'm, I'm sure the Lord will let me know when, uh, when he says enough is enough. And we'll move on. But this morning I want us to look at this very familiar passage of Scripture, much like we did John 3.16, a couple of weeks ago. And this time we're going to look at this psalm because these verses are indeed for all to hear. It's not just for you and me. It's not just for, for church folks. It's for all to hear. And the message is that regardless of what we're facing, regardless of the situation, God is our shepherd. And as we look at the psalm, let's do so in a little more in-depth approach as to its meaning, much like we did John 3.16. And we usually hear this psalm at a funeral service, and many folks will say, well, this is my, my favorite psalm, and it may be your favorite psalm. But when's the last time you've read it and really understood and listened and, and determined what God was trying to say to you through that particular message? It's really an awesome message to live by, not just to die by. You know, sometimes we think Psalms 23 is just, just a, a psalm to die by. It gives us comfort, 
for those who uh, have passed on. It gives us comfort to, to live after they've passed on. But this is a psalm for us to live by more so than to die by. And I want to look at it uh, in uh, several different phases here, several different verses. And I want to look at it in the context of living. Not dying, but living. First thing he says, the Lord is my shepherd. What's that mean to you? Lord is my shepherd. And if you know anything about sheep, he, David was, was a shepherd and he took care of sheep. And if you know anything about sheep, you know they're considered to be one of the dumbest animals alive and are in constant need of care. Somebody's got to take care of them. They can't take care of themselves. And it's been proven that, that sheep can be in the very sight of water and thirst to death. They don't have enough sense, even though they're thirsty, to go drink the water that's available. And the shepherd then has to, to prod them along. He has to push them along a little bit to get them where they need to be. The shepherd knows where they need to be. He knows what they need. And here it is. But you have to prod them to get them to go and to drink. Now the shepherd in the Old Testament didn't own any of his sheep. But he was totally responsible for them. And he was responsible for their care. And the same is true for us today. The shepherd is God. And he helps us in every area of our lives. And he is much like the shepherd as he binds our wounds. He protects us from the evil that seemingly comes our way every single day. He is gentle. Sometimes he is very firm. Sometimes he, he prods us along. That's what the staff is for. And he, he may poke us a couple of times to, to get us where we really need to be. But that's a part of the responsibility of the shepherd. And we have his lifeline, which is, which is his word. But sometimes we, we thirst to death spiritually when it's lying right beside of us. And we ignore it because we don't think it can help us in any way. But that's why God gave it to us. He is our shepherd. He guides us. He directs us. And he moves us in the direction that he knows is best for us. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Uh, sheep require plenty of green pasture on which to graze. They're always eating. They have continual needs and they can't provide for themselves at all. And so in, in the believer's context of this part of the psalm, this means that God is going to provide at some level all of our needs. He's going to provide my needs. He's going to provide your needs according to his will for us. Well, in other words, uh, means that, that God's going to provide nourishment for us. The body, the mind, and, and the soul. And he's going to take care of us in all aspects of living. He's going to guide us. He's going to direct us in the way that he wants us to go. But one of our biggest problems is that, that we most often want more than we need. You ever want more than you need? Well, if I just had one more of these or, or one more of that, I would be totally satisfied. My wife gets on me all the time. I've got five vehicles. <laughs> Three of them are, are antiques. And she said, you still can't drive but one at a time. So I bought a trailer so I could pull one behind it, right? right. <laughs> I've got more than I need. 
And many times we are like that. God provides our need, but sometimes our problem is we want more than what we need. The most important thing that he provides for us, and and we see this thread throughout the entire psalm, is that he provides for us eternal life as we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the main part of the psalm. That's the main part of, of who God is. He provides eternal life. He provides salvation for us because he knows we need it because we are sinful people. And he provides it for us. But sometimes we're, we're even not satisfied with that. We, we seem to want even more. And I think that's why he, he follows up and he says, He leadeth me beside the still waters. And this continues the theme of the previous line in, that we just looked at. We're, we're, we're living in a very hectic and chaotic world. And I guess every generation at some point in their life has made that statement. We're living in a, a hectic and, and chaotic world. It's always changing. We, we never know what's going to bring uh, difficulty to us tomorrow or next year. We, we just are in a state of somewhat anxiety and anticipation, not knowing what's coming. And every generation has faced that. We're facing that right now. Difficulties abound. We have no idea what the headlines are going to be tomorrow that may change the entirety of the direction of our lives. We have no idea. But the difference, it seems, that that we're not doing nearly as well in dealing with our issues as the previous generations. And it seems like most of the waters we come across today in our lives are pretty rough, aren't they? And we're facing things that we've never faced before, but each generation has faced things that they've never faced before. And sometimes we, we seem to find ourselves falling into complacency, and we're satisfied with, with the way things are. And I think sometimes that God just kind of stirs the pot on us to wake us up and say, look, I'm not into complacency. I didn't call you to be complacent. I called you to be a servant. I'm your shepherd. I know what is best for you. I'm going to take care of you. And there are times when you will need rest. And and I will give you that because I lead you beside the still waters. There are dangers that we face. They're demanding. They're life and spiritually threatening. And the still waters in this psalm represent the comfort to our hearts that God gives us in our times of despair, both in life and in death as we mourn those that we lose through death. But we fail to realize that that He is speaking to us in life. And the still waters have this this calming effect on us in our times of difficulty here in this life. And the psalmist is speaking here to to the living, again, as he does throughout the entire psalm. And in most every funeral service that I do, especially at the graveside service, I'll make a statement similar to this the funeral service is more for the living than it is for the one who has passed away because the one who has passed away is in the hands of God we can't do anything to change that but I'm here to proclaim to you the gospel message of Jesus Christ that can bring about change while you are living And Psalms 23 describes how to go about that. It describes who God is and what His desire is for each of us. So it's definitely for the living. And we have, again, His his lifeline. And and we need to look at His lifeline. And we need to, to study His lifeline. We need to know what it says. And it gives us comfort. And it gives us peace.
He says, I shall not want. It's a very powerful statement, isn't it? I shall not want. Uh, No, it simply means I have everything I need. So why do I want anything else? I shall not want. God is giving me what I need. Even peace in the times of great difficulty, God is there. He's giving me what I need. Now, our problem is that sometimes our our ego wants more. But God is saying that I'm going to care for you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to provide for you mercy and grace. I'm going to offer you the gift of eternal life. And I think these these words are are some of the most powerful and convicting words in the Psalms. Uh, I shall not want because I know who God is. I know what he has done. I know what he is doing. I know what he has promised to do in my life. So I shall not want. I I have no need to want more than what God has given to me. But many times I'm afraid we don't realize what we're saying when we repeat those words. It becomes more repetitious than it becomes personal to us. Then he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Sheep need plenty of green pasture on which to graze. And they have this this continual need to eat, kind of like us. Uh, We have a continual need to eat, don't we? And God is going to provide at some level for all of our needs. And he's going to take care of us. But these still waters are amazing. And if you've ever been out on rough waters in a boat, it could be very scary at times. Be very scary. But there's a calming effect in the still water, isn't it? And it brings peace to our heart. brings peace to our soul. And we can sit there and we can realize and we can look at God's creation around us. Because the still waters are, are that comforting to us. And he says, he restoreth my soul. You know, when we're dealing with, with great difficulty, they, they sometimes feel that the soul has... Uh, has been stolen from us or it's been destroyed by by despair and when we turn to the Lord we find that there's comfort and our souls are restored and and renewed and God renews his presence in our lives he renews how powerful he is and how much he loves us as Chuck has mentioned this morning he, he loves us we don't know why but he does he really does And then we have this this power and and the presence of the Holy Spirit who brings comfort and healing to our lives. But to be restored means that we have to turn to Him for that restoration. We can't restore ourselves. It comes from God. He restores my soul. And this is many times where, where we fail. We fail to accept what God's offered to us. He offers us comfort and peace in our times of, of anxiety and loss and despair. And we can claim that promise today by trusting Him. But that, again, is where we fail. We just don't have the trust that the sheep have in the shepherd. God is still God. 
God still loves you. And God's still our shepherd, and he takes care of us. And those, those are things that we need to remember every day. Then he says, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And when times of difficulty come, we oftentimes don't know in which direction to go. And many times, if we don't consult God, if we try to go in the direction that we think is right, we end up going the wrong way. Ever been there, done that? We go the wrong way. But I think this particular verse assures us that, that the Lord's going to lead us in the right direction, in the direction of righteousness, meaning that he's going to give us the integrity and the knowledge and the wisdom and the guidance to follow the right way instead of the seems right way. And the right way will bring glory and honor to him and peace and hope to us. It brings encouragement to us in our times of difficulty. Then he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now the psalmist shifts here from, from helping us through this life to include helping us into eternity. And this tells us that at some point in our lives, all of us are going to have to make that difficult walk. Everyone here this morning, everyone in the world, at some point is going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No one is excluded. No one is exempt. And we'll all face that day, but as believers, God is walking with us. And Jesus is telling us, the psalmist is telling us, that we will not walk through that valley alone if we are a believer. And to take that walk of faith as we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, that leads us to eternal life. That's an awesome verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Wow. Many before us have made that walk. They've come out on the other side of the physical death victoriously in the presence of Christ. Every one of us here has yet to make that walk, but we'll make it someday. And we can be assured by this psalm that we need not fear that walk because we're not walking by ourselves. We're not walking alone. We're not going into the unknown, so to speak. We're going into what God has already promised us, which is eternity for the believer. And we walk victoriously. It's not just, just a walk through the, sh the, the shadow of the valley of death. It's, it's not just a walk. It's a victorious walk. I kind of think of it like uh, the army coming back in, in the Old Testament, New Testament times in parades of celebration. And they're coming back, and, and they know that they've been victorious, and they have won the battle. And as we walk through that valley, and we come out on the other side, in the very presence of God himself, we have won the battle. And we stand victoriously in the presence of our God. He says, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. I don't know if you've ever seen the shepherds. Uh, traditionally, shepherds carried a rod and a staff simply to guide the sheep, to ward off the wild animals and uh, so forth. And the metaphor here is that the Lord also has his rod and his staff for us. And you may get prodded. You may get a little push every now and then. You may be challenged at times. But it's for our own good. That's why God does that. That's why the shepherd does that with the sheep. 
He is to take care of them, and God takes care of us in the same manner. And this isn't necessarily a, a pleasant thought for us to be referred to as sheep, is it? Uh, one reason is because they're the dumbest animal in the barnyard. And, and we don't want to admit that, that we resemble anything like a sheep. But in all probability, we, we could be pretty close cousins because our actions are pretty much the same. Even though God has what's best for us, we seem to be looking for something else. And we don't always follow his proddings. And therefore comes the rod and the staff. And when we do that, we can't take care even of our basic needs. Just like the sheep. And all humanity today is much the same. There are people all around us sitting in the light and the presence of Christ. They've heard the gospel message but still reject it. Because they want more. But God protects us just as the shepherd protects the sheep for our own protection and to keep us on the right path. But it sure seems like we're just like the sheep sometimes and, and we stray from the path. We don't want to follow God's path. But what we need to realize in the living is that the rod and the staff are to comfort us and to let us know that we are cared for, that we are loved, that we are protected. And he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. This implies that our enemies don't want us to believe any of that. They, they don't want us to believe that we can rely upon God, that God is going to take care of us, that God is, is big enough, that God is great enough to take care of us. And if Satan can get us to doubt that God, the shepherd in this psalm, if he can get us to doubt that God can take care of us, then he's pretty much won the battle in our lives. But he says there, there's a table, there's a feast that will be spread before us, even while we're in the presence of those Forces that oppose us. How many times has, has God protected us? How many times has God delivered us from the hands of evil? If we would just stop and, and think of how many times God has protected us in, in all kinds of situations in life. How he has prepared that feast for us, that table for us. It would give us great comfort. And we're seated at the table that God has prepared for us. What better place, what greater place could we ever be than to be seated around the table that God has prepared, especially for each of us. He says, Thou anointest my head with oil. And that was a practice in early biblical days. And that was to honor a person and to dignify or set aside that person. And it means not only that you will be fed and cared for in the presence of your enemies, but that you'll be honored and respected. The Lord has set us aside. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, He has set you aside. You are different. You are alien from this world. You are God's workmanship. You have been set aside. You are special. And God wants to use you and bless you and guide you in all that you do. And he says, my cup runneth over. You know, I think this is an exciting verse if we 
read it correctly? In the non-spiritual realm, when your cup runs over, it, it means generally that you made a mess, doesn't it? In a spiritual sense, it means something entirely different. And here it means that we're given more than we need or we can use. And we're blessed beyond expectation and far more than we deserve. You know, I cringe every time I I hear someone say, I deserve this or I deserve that. We don't deserve anything other than what God gives to us. We are a sinful people. We don't deserve anything but punishment and death. And God loved us enough to give us eternal life through Christ. It's a powerful image. And it means that we are truly abundant We're abundantly loved. We're abundantly cared for. Far beyond our every need. And if you're in the right relationship with Christ. Your cup is running over. It's running over. And if it's not running over today. It could be. If you're in the right relationship. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. This means that God's mercy and grace is going to follow me forever. It goes with us wherever we go. It's a statement of of present and future protection. And Jesus emphasizes this in the New Testament when he says, I am with you always. Not just part of the time. I am with you always in every situation that you might face. I am with you. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Even walking through the valley of the shadow of death, as a believer, Jesus is walking by our side. And then he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now to me, this is one of the most exciting verses in scripture I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever see this is to be in the very presence of God he's not someone we're we're praying to but we're in his very presence And this is the completion of the promise given to us by Jesus. And we should be thankful for that every single day. And King David was was thankful when he wrote that. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, he says. Wow. God's prepared a place for us. One day he's coming and, and he's going to receive us unto his own. We walk through that dark valley, but it brings us into life eternal. And I can only imagine what that's going to be like. Uh, What could be any better than that for a believer? Sometimes I wonder if we can even comprehend that. There's a song written uh, quite a few years ago now. I can only imagine it's still sung. Uh, pretty much on the radio that's what he talks about I can only imagine what it's going to be like I can only imagine but we're going to be in the very presence of God the shepherd for eternity and I also need to point out and, and continue to point out that this is only for the believer It's only for the believer. And here's the most important question that you will ever be asked. Are you ready for it? Everybody awake, pay attention. Where would you spend eternity if your life on this earth ended today?
Where would you be? There's only two choices. Eternal life, eternal death. Where would you be? There's no in-between, there's no uh, purgatory, there's no waiting for someone to be baptized for you after you die. There's no other place to go. Eternal life, eternal death. And there's only one way to get there. Eternal life is through Christ Jesus, through God's mercy and grace. And the death of Christ, his sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. And our acceptance of that. By your profession of faith in Christ Jesus, you'll one day claim all of these promises that the psalmist is giving us here this morning. But we can claim them now as believers because this psalm is as much for the living as it is the dead. And we need to live in God's grace and God's mercy and in God's way and and His direction. Now, Jesus says to us, he's going to prepare prepare a place for us. And he's going to come again and receive us. So again, where would you spend eternity if this were your last day on earth? The Lord is my shepherd. Now, let me close by just sharing John 14, 1 through 6. I think Jesus kind of sums up this psalm. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we, we don't, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's what the psalmist was trying to tell us in Psalm 23. Jesus has prepared a place for each of us. Are you going to claim it? Father, thank you for this psalm this morning. Words that speak to us about you. That you are a shepherd. And that you are here for us in every situation. You take care of us just as the shepherd took care of his sheep. And Lord, we are much like the sheep. We struggle at times and we get off track. We go in the wrong direction. We make wrong choices. But Lord, with your, the metaphor of your rod and your staff to, to pull us back, to get us back on the right path. To feed us and to love us and to protect us. We're thankful. Lord, there may be those here this morning who don't know you as Lord and Savior. They don't know you as the shepherd. I pray that this passage would have a, a deeper meaning to them this morning that it is for the living as well as for helping us in the loss of loved ones. That their hearts might be open to acknowledge that you are the Savior and that we're sinners in need of a Savior 
and you gave your life on that cross at Calvary to be our Savior. That they might open their heart to receive you this morning, acknowledging that they are a sinner in need of a Savior and you are that Savior. There may be other decisions that need to be made this morning. Uh, I pray that we don't leave here. We don't leave this building without making those decisions. And we give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I ask you to stand for our invitation. Our worship team is going to lead us. The Lord speaking to you. We invite you to come. You make that decision. He's placed on your life today. You come as the Lord leads. worshiping with us today. Pray that you'll have a great week as you go. Be aware that the Lord will uh, bring people across your path to share the gospel message with. God bless you as you go. Pastor Chuck. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Our deacons for this week, Tim Eicher and Carol Blake, and um, their information is up on the screen. Uh, Woody has already uh, told you how to contact them, and if you have a need, I pray that you will. Of course, you can contact staff uh, at any any point, any given time that you need us. Uh, Tim, I believe, is going to close us in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house once again to worship, praise, and glorify you. 
Thank you for the message that was delivered this morning. And I thank you for the songs of praise and honor that we lifted to you for your glory. Lord, be with our congregation as we go about our week, and may we bring glory to you in all that we do. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning, and uh, enjoy Sunday school.